panel discussion will explore the potential impact of large language models on the future of business and education. With the development of sophisticated natural language processing technologies, large language models like GPT-3 are poised to transform how we communicate, analyze data, and create content. Welcome. <laughs> so we're going to have three rounds. In each round, uh, they're going to get uh, one or two questions. Round one, cultural shift with ChatGPT. So uh, Tomislav, since the release of ChatGPT, we have all, we've all witnessed the skyrocketing use of it, not only the people in tech industry, but also the wider population. Uh, how do you explain this phenomenon and why does it happen? Let me, ah, okay. How do I explain the phenomenon? Well, first of all, the chat GPT was one of the first interaction where the non-techy people could see what AI can do for them. Up to that point, you had a smaller chat, uh, chatbot type of application tied to specific industry solutions, and they were focused on solving smaller type of the problems. And ChatGPT brought a little bit wider uh, definition and generalization of how you can communicate with it. And in majority of the time, it's good, really good and creative answers. Now, what we also see is that uh, because how it came, it became widely popular, as we already said, but at the same time, it brought a lot of issues because now people are thinking that uh, this type of technology is a golden bullet and it can solve everything. And uh, the other aspect of humanity came into action is the laziness. Now, everybody's using ChatGPT to write something. Nobody's doing fact-checking. Now, in education, we also lost critical thinking and nobody's focusing on the critical thinking and trying to uh, pull information and decide how they are quali uh, the quality of information itself and they believe whatever com comes out. Now, we, we had yesterday one really big discussion about, again, ChatGPT, but even now we had our own panel uh, with a coffee around ChatGPT, and one of the reasons is that ChatGPT is a people-pleaser model. So uh, one of the good examples is using Hugging Face as a technology aspect of large language models and using ChatGPT as non-tech entry into large language models is that if you ask them the same question, Hugging Face will give you a correct uh, uh, answer in one sentence or even one word, and ChatGPT will make an elaborate statement uh, describing the same sentence in three pages. So, yeah, that's the shift. Thank you. Uh, Borna, what difference do you see in communication with senior management uh, and their willingness to try AI in core business? And is it easier to talk with people regarding uh, the technology we have now. Yes, we definitely notice uh, a shift in communication with uh, senior management uh, since ChatGPT became popular. Uh, so basically, there is a, obviously there is a push from their side to investigate all possible use cases of large language models in our company, and it's always um, I'm always glad to see that the the highest management is also trying out these things and that it's already communicating with its employees about um, its own observ observations about these models. And um, I'm also happy when such a breakthrough happens because it uh, makes our job a lot easier of, uh, of promoting AI as a field because everyone uh, is, has at least heard about it and tried tried it out and most of the people are very satisfied with the results so they naturally want to know how these models work and they ask a lot of questions and so on. Okay, thank you. Um, Wolf, how can we use this wave to push even further projects and data-driven culture inside of the companies? Well, I think Borner just, just mentioned it, the awareness raised monumentally and that's on the one hand a very good thing um, because you can use this awareness um, for various stuff but um, I don't know if you're all uh, aware of, of the hype cycle that's you know, an old concept it has also a downside expectations are very high 
So, um, yes, to push something, awareness, inside companies is good. If the board is asking you, hey, I, I just used that to create some, some speech of mine, and can, can't we use that in our company, then you say, well, yeah, that's possible. Maybe not ChatGPT, but something similar. Uh, but in the end, it's like, uh, yeah, but is it tomorrow? And come on, I mean, it, it's, it's working. So come on, next week, isn't, isn't it? So expectations are quite high. And the answers to these questions then, why doesn't it work immediately now, are complicated. So I would say awareness is good, but we also have to um, dampen the expectations a bit in sense of, yes, it's good that hundreds of millions of people have, have used ChatGPT, my parents, grandparents, your grandparents, your, your parents, I think nearly, nearly everyone. But expectations are so high now. You, you, you talked about the golden bullet. It's like Messiah is coming. <laughs> no, it's not. Maybe some disciple of the Messiah is coming. So um, on the one hand, I'm, I'm happy about it, like, like you said. On the other hand, I try to, to think about the, uh, <laughs> in one or two mon months, in a few months, the, let's say, uh, valley of unmet expectations, then like, it's not happening now. Why? Come on. So that's why you also have to be a bit cautious here. And there is the critical thinking you, you talked about. Okay, let's move to uh, round two. A uh, series of questions, implication on business. Uh, Warna A1 Group is known for its uh, clear desire to innovate. Have you tried to, to implement LLMs in A1 Group business model? Uh, and what are some of the takeaways you have learned during this process? Uh, yes, we have been um, successfully using large language models since 2019 in order to route user emails in the correct uh, category and in order to speed up the process of answering all the user emails. So it's been really fun working on that project. Um, at that time, there, wasn't, there weren't many resources online available on how to employ these models. But um, yeah, so a lot of research and development was needed in that first phase. So yeah, um, I would say there's also uh, some room for um, communication with some smaller companies that are uh, offering uh, their expertise in connecting uh, uh, connecting uh, our data with ChatGPT, but you have to be very careful here. Uh, mostly it's not an option for us because we have very strict rules about data privacy. So everything we do, we do internally and locally on our own servers. So. So in this uh, maybe five, six, three, six years, we developed um, a lot of our internal solutions like um, custom-made uh, search for our knowledge base, um, chatbot solution, various text classification and um, spell checking solutions and so on. Thank you. Um, Wolf, uh, why is the AI initiative so important to Generali and what kind of impact on the core business of insurance it may have in your opinion? Well, um, large language models for, for insurances are, are I think, uh, very important, but out of the same or similar reasons I think you, uh, you just talked about, what insurances are, are dealing with, uh, with are massive amounts of text massive amounts of, of documents and a lot of the processes are about understanding these and giving answers to these, very, very simply speaking. So when, when you ask me about why it's, um, why it's important, on the one hand, we are back to this awareness thing, that's good. On the other hand, um, like you said, can we really then use this solution? Mostly not, because it's cloud, it's it's complicated, legal, compliance, and so on and so forth. Uh, but um, what is behind um, GPT, ChatGPT, 
are technologies which you can use. I'll just give you one, one example. We are behind ChatGPT, something called transformer models. It's a type of neural network and, and they are very powerful. And for example, one of the, uh, of the use cases for an insurance, but I'm sure also sure for A1, is actually extracting knowledge from documents. So that's old style, that's OCR, optical character recognition and so on, but with transformer models, you can do that without. So you can just uh, feed in your, your documents, millions of it, and then ask questions about that. And we are very often asked exactly these, these questions. So all our um, employees are, are, are asked that. So short, maybe not ChatGPT is the answer, but the technology behind it is very powerful for insurances like, like Generali. Thank you. And Tomislav, do you think that LLM, LLM, LLMs can change the very nature of jobs and how it correlates with the existing, existing business model? And can you see some new jobs? Well, definitely it will change because nowadays everybody is using LLMs. And I'll just, before I continue, I'll, I would like to iterate also on Wolf's question to be a little bit expanding and more uh, Fire. paneling. Fire away. <laughs> uh, we also did experience that all the, all the company have a bunch of documents and like 80 to 90% of the data of any company is unstructured type of the documents. Either we are talking about claims or medical data, et cetera, et cetera. And we are coming to the position where you need to extract the knowledge from those type of the documents. So now you have like a solution which generally does and uh, does a smart search and a smart Q&A session with the documents itself. And then from the other side, you have um, other type of, where you need to integrate them in uh, relational type of the forms where you can do analytics on top of it in a large scale environment. It's, we started in our company to use LLMs to build a data integration pipelines on type, on type of unstructured documents where users are talking with the document and based on your talk with the document, it creates a flow of the data processing. Now we do really see emergence of LLM models across the board. So yes, we are focusing now of extracting information from the text which in uh, generating context of it or summary of the documents, etc., etc. But we do other type of sensitive acti uh, sensory activities coming into action like videos, audio, etc., etc., which now uh, talk with uh, LLMs and create a multimodal uh, type of solutions to answer some of them. Like, uh, in GPT-4, now you have a multimodal type of solution where you can add uh, images and talk with the images itself and get an answer or videos, etc. And have all of those sensory activities. And LLMs will definitely change the nature. And one of the interesting points is that who will not be impacted by LLM? Well, everybody will be impacted. I think uh, it's not here, but Leo from Algebra did talk yesterday about what they did uh, a bit of research and how they started to change it on the educational side because impact can be either positive or negative depending how you are using the technology. Uh, human in their nature are lazy and uh, if they are using uh, technology just to remove some piece of the work from them and offload and automate everything without trying to do anything substantial with that time will definitely end uh, with uh, downgrade of uh, knowledge of downgrade of uh, quality of the results. So definitely that will be negative impact in my solution. But if you use the LLM to generate something and free your time from automating some of the stuff and then use the time to create a new knowledge, we'll benefit. So now that's a tricky part, how we measure impact on a society, etc. And there will definitely be some of the industries which are not being impacted where LLM can't work. Do you expect that your plumber will come and work with LLM? No. Uh, do we expect that uh, LLMs will uh, read the claim when somebody uh, sends the note that there is an issue with uh, plumbing in your facility and then they will know who to send to fix it? Yes. So it will be a cross-industry type of uh, uh, collaboration, but uh, the future will definitely need to change and uh, it will come with a new type of uh, business models like now we are everybody is talking about 
uh, studying to be a prompt engineer. So how to write uh, Q, uh, questions for uh, LLM model that they will send result correctly. Because currently, if you don't know how to write correctly, you can get gibberish. The majority of LLMs are built on uh, wide volumes of the data, and this is why they look so smart. But they are not smart. They just find next best sentence. And yesterday we had a really good answer is that if you ask ChatGPT to recommend you uh, itinerary for your trip, it can be great or it can be completely rubbish. It can be great today, and one of the professors talked yesterday about that one. It, it can be really great, but day after you ask the same question, and it will be completely different. So there is no uh, focus and, let's say, uh, predictability in outcome. And if we lost critical thinking, then we definitely don't know, and we believe what we are getting is an answer, then, uh, uh, yeah, we are doomed. <laughs> but, but I just want to, to add something to, to prompt engineering. You know the reason why, why it's so, so um, interesting at the moment. Come on, I mean, 300K a year yeah. on LinkedIn. Well, it depends. So every, like even for a data science, they said that it's uh, the sexiest, sexiest wor uh, job you can have and it's best paid. But nowadays, you go in the US in a financial district and yell that you know technology which is 30 years old, you'll get 500K or you'll get a million because you know something which are their current core models which nobody else knows how to replace it, etc. So yes, prompt engineering, 300K on LinkedIn. Yeah. There's a few of them. I mean, that, that got the attention of a lot of people maybe, but how, how long it will hold, and yes, I, I also know the, the sexiest job of the universe. I mean, come on, who doesn't want to be sexy? Yeah. Yes, thank you very much. So, uh, moving on round three, evolution of education. So, chat, GPT, and education. Will it change the nature of how we learn, how we educate ourselves? Will we become lazier? Will we become idiots? And how you already said, fact checking does not exist. So how will the future look like um, with ChatGPT and education? Well, um, I think I know your stance on that now. <laughs> <laughs> um, so answering your, your question in, in one word, I would say yes. And I think it already started because um, people are just using it. So nobody has a big plan about it or whatever. Yeah. Um, I'm pretty sure that one of the um, most um, yeah, <laughs> most users maybe are under 25, and uh, we just had this this, uh, this survey before. I think the, the talk, yeah, yeah, yeah. the talk before. Marina. Um, and I think this correlation was very interesting with people under 25. Uh, are the least likely to say that's wrong. So like, come on, it's coming out of ChatGPT, has to be right or something like that. And this is come, comes to your, and the older the people in, in the survey got, the more they said, ah, I'm not sure, whatever. Mm -hmm. um, so I think it's very dynamic in the, in the education field because just the most users there are people who are, needs to write, I don't know, some essay about Shakespeare and maybe are not interested in Shakespeare. I think we all experienced something similar like that. Um, so I think the most intelligent is maybe the wrong word, the fittest kids will then use it maybe for inspiration and say, come on, uh, please write three pages about it and I will read, I will read through it and then do my stuff and then give it to the teacher. And there I would say, okay, come on. He was inspired uh, by it. He invested some, some work and didn't read three novels about Shakespeare. <laughs> well, let's see what that means then. And from an, from an educational side, from, from the teacher side, I think, I think, the, the, I think there's a very mixed reaction it's very extreme, I, I have the feeling. So the one side is like, oh my God, I will, I will, my people have to write now every essay by hand. Okay, why? No, because then ChatGPT can't do it. And 
So then people will then pay, I'm pretty sure people will then pay other people to write it for them. Well, yeah. it, it, something completely happened on this uh, direction where they created robots I know. which will I've get an it. output you can of GPT that. to <laughs> handwrite it. So it will simulate handwriting. So, so um, I remember a time, so because I'm more experienced and nearly experienced as yeah. you, I think, <laughs> um, that it was, um, there was in Word this actual spell checking and then it was like, oh my God, automatic spell checking in Word in school. We will all die and not be able to, to write correct sentences anymore. Well, you can have an argument about that, but in the end, we, it seems we didn't die and school is still there and people are still learning something somehow, not an expert on that. But I think to embrace it and to use these new um, possibilities from teacher side and from pupil side, I think, in my opinion, that that's the way forward because it will be used anyway. Well, good luck to teachers <laughs> nowadays. Can I just ask one question to audience? Yeah, sure. Do you know which AI technology was first used in uh, education of, let's say, first in the US? before ChatGPT and other came? Anybody? Nobody. Google Translate. But people use Google Translate to read for them. So speech to, oh, text to speech. So they became even lazy to read some of the things. And this is also where we need to see how the technology impacts our free times and what we do with it. So they use Google, well, they still use Google Translate to, uh, to read instead of them which uh, begs the point uh, what will happen with education. Uh, technology shift which started in 90s with onboarding all the, uh, all the people online and having access to majority of the documents which we previously needed to go through the public libraries and read a lot of documents to do something physically, uh, went into shift of uh, shallow and deep reading, which means if you have a digital screen and you read something from it, you will forget it really fast. The reason why is because all the browsers, all the emails, etc., uh, helped us to understand that there is something called uh, uh, bookmarking, there are drafts, etc. So if I have a bookmark, if I have a draft, I don't need to remember it. I'll find it when I need it. If you use a book, yeah, try to find in 500 pages book a single word, Good luck. So unless you have eidetic memory that you can uh, have like a uh, photographic memory to uh, focus on a specific page, yeah, you need to go through 500 pages and find a specific words or a specific et cetera, et cetera segment. I remember an element from our, my school, the faculty of electronic, electronic engineering. You, you could take a book on exam because you had two books, uh, each of them 400 pages, and if during exam you know where to find the formulas or specific text, good luck. But you have 45 minutes to complete your task. So it means that if you are able to find it, you don't need to remember specific formula. You know how to use it and you know where it is. So yeah, education will definitely need to do it. Oh, did I skip your, your line? <laughs> uh, education definitely needs to go uh, into the direction of um, back to the roots, how we learn. So yes, people are using for creating essays, etc. but ask ChatGPT to solve mathematical problem. It's still lacking. So ChatGPT is now doing integration to Microsoft technology like Wolframs, etc., to have that type of reasoning. This is also the re reason why Google are now buying our creation of Photomat because they want to get that uh, full streamlining of solving mathematical equations, etc. Math is one of the part. So how do we do education itself? I think uh, uh, Nordics are doing really exceptional because they are not doing a traditional uh, aspect of the learning how we still do it. Our tradition, well, our way of the learning how the rest of EU does is it, uh, based on industry or industrial age because we are learning based on our date of manufacturing when we are born. You go first grade, second grade, et cetera, et cetera. They started to mix and match in Nordics. They started to expel specific topics. You don't have a math. You don't have a history. You don't have a biology. You go year by year. What happened from the field of math 
1992, what happened from the uh, physics, what happened in the world economy, etc. And you start seeing how each of those things are linking to each other, and uh, people more adapt to learn things when they connect. Learning why uh, 10,000 people died on specific battle, yeah, you'll know that 10,000 10, people died because uh, on that specific place, but you don't know the reasons and what led. Uh, did, uh, was it happening uh, due to the research, how the military equipment will be during those days, or somebody uh, who is crazy, like Napoleon, told them, advance, even if you see everybody shooting on you, yeah, run. So, yeah, it's a short answer, about 45 minutes. <laughs> uh, I will use then ChatGPT to summarize that for me. <laughs> Uh, Borna, how can big companies support education in fastly moving industries such as AI? Does A1 have some support programs for young professionals? Uh, yeah, we do have an um, official platform for, through which we can um, access uh, virtually any course from any of the major learning platforms like Coursera, Udemy, O'Reilly's and similar. But uh, what's more important is what I believe is that to set aside some time every week to experiment, to learn, to read something new, which have, we have a practice at A1 to do every Friday. So that's how all great projects in our uh, department started by management giving us enough time, resources and free hands to do and research whatever we wanted and to experiment and that's what I think allowed us to start using large language models back in 2018 when only maybe a couple months ago, uh, a couple months later after the first paper pub was published in the world that suggested pre-training models on, on text. So I believe that the, the maybe the best way for um, companies to support young professionals by giving them enough time and resources and believing in them to, to come up with something, yeah. Okay, a last question for all three of you. Uh, have you used ChatGPT? Obviously, all three of you did. And for what did you use it for? Do I want to? Oh, okay. I use it for brainstorming. So, because I really do not believe about uh, quality, well, not quality, about precision of the results which ChatGPT will push out. Uh, if you, you get uh, some summary and you get some text generated, if you ask to elaborate and show you uh, evidence from where the, those information came, you can't get it. And we are again uh, coming back to critical thinking, how to validate idea, depending what you are doing. So I like to use it just for brainstorming. It, it, if you are not in a group of the people with whom you can brainstorm, you can brainstorm with a chat GPT and start uh, pitching ideas and it will start answering. Yes, it has an uh, issue that at some point uh, chat GPT will start uh, doing hallucination. So at that point you need to stop and uh, restart the models, etc. It, it has its own issues. But uh, it will give you some constructive, let's say, concept on which you can work outside of chat GPT. But OpenAI, which built ChatGPT, has other technologies which are, in my opinion, even better than uh, uh, ChatGPT itself. They built a Whisper for audio separation and translation, which is really great, and it has still uh, potential to be extended and it will continue. And this is now what is coming in GPT-4, et cetera, et cetera, with all of those multimodals. So that would be my use. I, but can I again return to the learning? Uh, because bes besides my daily job, I also have one additional startup which is focusing on the lifelong learning. We are now in a space where everybody needs to learn on a daily basis. Otherwise, yeah, you become obsolete really fast, regardless what you do. You see the small pharmacies, you see small hair uh, dress agency, all of them have some kind of analytics on top of it that they can predict either their a future income or spending, etc., so that they can uh, manage their budgets, etc. So, it now da data uh, usage goes everywhere, and we do see this that upskilling is daily work, as we see that comp big companies are also allowing Fridays, etc. But it's now happening everywhere. You need to learn on a daily basis, 
either you will become really obsolete, regardless what you are doing. Even if you are uh, doing, uh, uh, putting the tiles in your bathrooms, this is also something which is evolving on a daily basis. Uh, how do you do it, how, what type of materials, etc., etc. And we started to empower, well, build AI, different AI models to do different types of uh, elements for education. Because people with the same psychological traits, so if Wolf and I have sim uh, similar psychological traits and have the same goal, what we would like to learn, uh, it would be most likely that we get paired to uh, learn those objectives. Because if both of us are similar and have same objective, we'll push each other to learn this faster. So you come to that gamification mode. Now you see how the ga gaming industry start to interact with the uh, learning industry because through gamification or learning experience, you get those knowledge quicker. Let and me, we, just one, one smaller... One point to that. Yeah, go ahead. Because, because it's, uh, it's fitting, because you say it's pairing. Yeah. And I, I read an article a few, a few weeks ago about ChatGPT and the usage of it, and a lot of um, are using it for programming. And this, uh, this woman used it for pair programming, which is one technique to, to do programming. And uh, for pair, mm -hmm. so was ChatGPT. So she was like, okay, do me that. And then it was like, oh, okay, that's okay, but it, it's inspiring me, but I can do it better. Yeah, okay. And then Iteration. back and forth, back and forth. So maybe it, uh, your pair should, don't, doesn't have to be a human. Yeah, yeah. No, I do agree. So it's just how you are linked to speed up the process of everything. Yeah. Just then, so. Cool. Wolf, what did you use ChatGPT Ch for? Um, what I said now to, to inspire me. Um, maybe similar to, to, to brainstorming, for sure. Um, but for example, for, for today, yes, I couldn't resist and said, okay, I'm on a panel about artificial intelligence. So inspire me now. What, what should I do and what should I, shouldn't I do? So I should be concise and short sentences and don't block the microphone and so on. Okay, yeah, I mean, all fair, fair stuff, but in a concise manner. And it was like, I don't know, out of 10 points, eight were like, yeah, okay. Two were like, okay, yeah, well, I can think about that. So, and really doesn't take that much time and uh, it's just you said with facts I know I'm a bit cautious about that like yeah that sounds very probable but hmm is it really like that so you can't be sure at the moment so um, for stuff like that and and also if you want to produce something new like okay give me give me some some draft now about that it starts thinking, and what I really liked and is what I what I said before, this interactive mode where you then just play back and forth. This function sometimes good, sometimes not really. That that I'm really interested in because sometimes um, by just stating your problem and formulating it, you already learn learn something. This is the chat. You, you have maybe on, on the Fridays, like when you talk to, to a colleague and this colleague doesn't even know what you're talking about or vaguely, but then, oh yeah, you helped me, thanks. Mm -hmm. So this, this happens sometime, just when you have a partner with whom you can talk to. So I think these, these are the two things. What about you? Well, yeah, obviously at work we use it sometimes to solve some difficult uh, problems when we are stuck on some, on some issues. But uh, for personal use, I I'm sometimes use it to, which I have learned through some online uh, tutorials, to use it to give me a detailed step-by-step -step plan for learning huh? about some new topic. So it yep. can generate uh, its recommendations for some books or re resources and courses. Mm -hmm. And it, it can give you some, um, sure. some, yeah, some instructions on how to learn a certain topic. But I also use it for some mundane th things like uh, I, I, I asked it to give me top 10 reasons why getting a dog is a good idea. <laughs> and it successfully convinced me. So I got myself a dog and 
it's been great. But did you try to ask why it's not? Yeah, good? exactly. That, yeah, <laughs> that, would yeah. Be that was my bias. Yeah, I didn't want to <laughs> learn about negative things. I just <laughs> wanted positive. Uh, you learn it without ChatGPT. Yeah. So have you asked? Should I get a dog? And what kind of dog? <laughs> <laughs> and I just, I just asked about uh, like all the health benefits and okay, it's gonna be great. Yeah. Cool. Which type of dog? Thank you very much. If somebody has a question, feel free to ask. I know we are we are now in front of lunch, so that's maybe yeah. <laughs> hard. It would be easier if it's after lunch they could sleep. <laughs> but we will be at lunch uh, also, so if something comes to your mind. Did, well, did anybody ask ChatGPT who you are? So he tells you all the wrong information. So just uh, 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 th yesterday we had this uh, round discussion and uh, was uh, things we could laugh about. So I just told uh, somebody, uh, can I ask ChatGPT, can you tell me who am I and wh what I want? Because sooner or later, we if we just give our thinking away, then we give ourselves away also. Yeah, so. uh, colleague Jolt also had a talk about NLPs and poetry. So yesterday yeah. we talked about that one. Uh, if you ask ChatGPT to write poetry instead of you, where's the creative process? And realistically, any type of generative AI is just generating based on something people did previously. So yes. how they can invent. Yes, we have uh, solutions which are now generating images. And majority of the people on those images have six fingers, etc., on each hand. Oh. So, yeah, well, maybe that's the future of humanity, so let's see. <laughs> uh, also, uh, there is uh, some kind of picture generated, uh, was sold for 100 million uh, euros or dollars. So who gets the money? The machine or yeah. the one who programmed the machine? So it's <laughs> or nobody. <laughs> yeah, somebody should get this. So. Uh, yeah, maybe and, and this picture is interesting, but uh, who, who, who gets the 100 million? <laughs> Chat GTP gets it. So that was also a topic about yesterday, about intellectual property in uh, generative models. Who gets a property of it at, at the end? And it depends where you are. If you are in Great Britain, yes, through the, their type of acts, you are an owner. In Europe, yeah, you are not. So it, it goes two, twofold. And, uh, in US, it depends who has more money, it will get intellectual property. And there is other issue where now we have artists complaining because all of those engines, both uh, uh, chat engines, um, image generating engines, etc., all of them are built on somebody else's data. And we know that stock photos for marketing activities were sold through different uh, portals, etc., and somebody used this to train generative images. And now, when you write some prompt to generate a picture for you, if you well, often you'll get a picture with the same uh, watermark on top of it of that uh, page, which is uh, essentially stock photos uh, selling those photos because it learned that there, it should have a watermark on top of it. Yes, it's generated by a machine, but it has a watermark. Uh, I have an um, observation maybe for Borna and Tomislava. Um, well, you said like we have to learn every day, otherwise we can quickly go out of business. But then also sometimes I feel like the technology is um, like but advancing mostly. too fast. So do you think that maybe um, this uh, trying to resolve a problem in your company, for example, um, when the technology just started, is just maybe losing of time or resources. Because today, when it advanced, uh, and maybe you are not the main player who made it advance, um, it became easier to resolve um, some problems that were very difficult, like two years ago. So there is like uh, irony. If they only were sleeping and not doing anything, today they could, do the same, for example. Before Borna answers, I would say that this is a really great question. 
No, I, I wouldn't say that that was a waste of time. Obviously, I think that 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 was a good invested time because you you started to think about these things, you started to learn about fundamentals, and you you have a much broader picture today because you you were there at the beginning. You know how it all started and what were the what were the problems at the beginnings, and now you you can appreciate uh, when something is uh, done more more efficiently. And um, if we didn't start then, I think that today we would be much more lost, and uh, we, we couldn't, we wouldn't be so um, like efficient with using these models today. Although they are much more simplified today than they were in before. Yeah. One of my professors in college said that examples are always uh, best done on examples. And uh, the reason why I said it's a really good question is because uh, technology is not an answer. So technology just leads you to some of the results. How you use it, this is where we need to uh, start constantly learning and uh, uh, approaching. Now I'll go back to example part. A few years ago, we started to uh, test, can we create a computer vision type of solution which will look into technical drawing and based on technical drawing, generate the complete path how industrial aspect or uh, assembly line should be done in some manufacturing site. Of all of those machines, what they need to be done, where you need a human, and how much it would be at the end cost for uh, producing a specific part based on a technical drawing. Now, we can simplify this and talk, maybe you need to, let's say, build a box. And that box needs to have a specific dimensions, holes, etc., and need to be folded differently, and that's a relatively simple example, which you can pull from a technical drawing. Like four or five years ago, this was really challenging problem. So uh, even on the research side, you couldn't find uh, how to calculate all the nice uh, outer, uh, outer lines, uh, all the, where you need to drill, where you need to uh, fold the metal or whatever parts are, and how to assemble this with expert knowledge later on. But three years later, it becomes much simpler because now you have a uh, donut type of solutions which helps you with looking into uh, technical drawings and getting shapes and objects and then you can work with them. When you have a shape, when you have a measuring side of it, you can now even calculate, ah, okay, I have a square, that, uh, cutting the square from the metal sheet uh, which is one inch thick, you need a laser and it will cost you in electricity X amount. Then you need to take this and fold it. So, Yes, maybe you are premature, but you did the research in this aspect and you saw that maybe technology now is not an answer, but it will guide you how to reach the, uh, some conclusion. This is also the reason why I like to uh, work with the students and we do a lot of student competitions. Is, yes, we are doing this for the last two decades, somebody more, 25 years or more with the data, but when you start talking with the students, you'll see the technology went way, way uh, where we were in 90s. Uh, business understanding went, um, problem solving went, and you see a different aspect how the same solution can be uh, tackled now. So this, uh, we are again returning back to critical thinking. We are learning when we are listening to others as well. So we'll get always in our, back, uh, um, in our mind that somebody said something which makes sense, so let's test this. And uh, also back to the survey, which Wolf also talked that uh, majority of the people under 25, they will believe in, in those things, in uh, elements coming from GTP and similar technology. This also comes back to TikTok and similar platforms because we are now in a short attention span uh, environments where nobody can uh, focus more than three to five minutes. So you need to provide even the learning and all aspects in a smaller chunks which will lead them to bigger price or bigger picture what they would like to uh, have at the end. Yes, it's a, I like to go across industries and read a lot so to learn. Maybe, maybe something just, just to add here. Mm -hmm. um, and I can just emphasize what, what both said, but I want to maybe summarize it, uh, it, it a bit more. Um, yes, technology, it seems, will, I don't know, always expand and, and develop, but as you said, technology is just one side. It's this desire to push the limit, 
It's this desire to push the boundary for finding solutions. So, and yes, you will always try to do the best you can with the tools you have at the moment. Yes, you hope that the tools and the, uh, and the technique is, is evolving. Sometimes it is, sometimes it's not linear. So, but you're right, you always learn something and in the end, it's a tool for solving problems. And these problems are often stay much more stable than technology. And you have a certain amount of skills mm -hmm. you talked about. And, but the bottom line is still the motivation, the motivation to push the boundaries. And I think this is, in my opinion, the core of it. And then you are, I mean, I'm just talking about myself. I'm not sad that I did it 15 years ago in a way which I said, oh my God, I could have done it now in two minutes, what I've done then in three months. And I'm talking about the very concrete example here because I did it in three months, which I can do that now in two minutes. And it's like some optimization problem. I'm a mathematician. Yeah, I can think about what the hell I lost three months of my life. No, I learned something there and I tried to push the limits and I solved it. So, okay, that's satisfying. Yeah, uh, thank you so much. <laughs> thank you so much. It's